Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Arielle Cates. I'm the Director of Programming at Village Preservation. And I am so glad that you are here with us and our friends at the Salma Gundy Arts Club this evening. Just a quick bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history and depth, and the value of preservation in our communities. We are a nonprofit membership-based organization, so your involvement and support mean the world to us. You can learn more at our website, villagepreservation.org, and please consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org slash donate. So just a little bit of Zoom protocol. I won't be visible during the talk, but I'll be here. So please feel free to use the chat to say hi, tell us where you're joining from, what brought you here, or to raise any issues or thoughts. If you have questions for our speakers specifically, please do use the Q&A function. It just helps me to keep track of them. You can do that at any point during the talk and we'll get to as many of your questions as we can um, following the presentation. So I am very delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. I'm gonna read their bios in the, in the order in which they'll, they'll talk to us this evening. Alex Kotlan is the Salma Gundy Club's librarian and the founder of Alexander Kotlan Conservator Incorporated, which provides in-depth museum quality work, documentation of fine paintings, and research emphasizing preserving the historical context of paintings. Mr. Catlin is a, prof a professional associate at the American Institute of Conservation and has received fellowships from the Smithsonian Institution, the National Museum of American Art, National Endowment for the Arts, and more. In 2008, Catlin was awarded the Medal of Honor and Merit from the Salma Gundy Club. He has published in many journals and has written four art reference books. Um, two of the latest books are on the exhibition history of the Salma Gundy Club. Uh, Mr. Catlin was also an adjunct professor at New York University in the Appraisal Studies Program for 12 years and has lectured broadly. Thank you, Ariel. Thank, Thank you, you Alex. Very much. Jacob Collins is the president of the Selma Gundy Club. Mr. Collins is a leading figure in the contemporary revival of classical painting. He earned a BA in history from Columbia College and attended the New York Studio School in our neighborhood the New York Academy of Art and the Art Students League. His work has been widely exhibited in North America and Europe and is included in several American museums. Collins is the founder of the Water Street Atelier, the Grand Central Academy of Art and the Hudson River Fellowship. Collins has been the subject of more than 20 solo exhibitions and his work is represented in numerous prestigious public and private collections. I would be here for the whole rest of the night. <laughs> Nicholas Dawes is an auctioneer, appraiser, author, lecturer, and, and antique dealer. Nick Nicholas is a former department head and auctioneer at Phillips and at Sotheby's in New York and has organized his own auctions at several prominent auction houses. Nick is the author of four standard works on decorative arts together with scores of articles and, lecture and, and he lectures widely internationally. He has been a faculty member of the Parsons School of Design since 1984 and has taught luxury marketing at Columbia Business School and courses on English and French furniture at the Bard Graduate Center. Nick is active with many charitable organizations and is the chairman and CEO of the Selma Gundy Club. He has been an appraiser on Antiques Roadshow for PBS since its beginning, where he discusses ceramics, glass, silver, and other arts. Patricia Watwood is a leading figure in the contemporary figurative realist movement, known for her narrative paintings, drawings, and portraiture. Her subjects are primarily women with themes of allegory, myth, and archetype. Watwood has been exhibited at the Beijing World Art Museum, 
M-E-A-M, the Butler Museum, and is in the collections of the St. Louis University Museum of Art, Harvard Art Museums, and the New Britain Museum of American Art. She is currently first vice president and resident artist of the Selma Gundy Club. And last but very not least, um, William Indersky is the chair of the Selma Gundy's curatorial committee and director of the nonprofit Emil Carson Carlson Archives since 2006. As chair of the curatorial committee, Bill works with the committee to mount important shows of Selma Gundy's 1,900 piece art collection. In 2017, Bill published a book on Danish American artist Emil Carlson, covering the artist's full range of work in English. Thank you all so much for being here. This is such a star studded lineup for us. We're so, so pleased. So, Alex, start us start us off and i'm going to just give me one moment to share my screen and i will be i will be here at your leisure okay thank you uh, ariel and i also would like to thank andrew berman uh, and, uh, and you, Ariel, for organizing this uh, wonderful Zoom event. And I also would like to thank the staff of Village Preservation for honoring the 150th anniversary of the Salman Gundy Club. Uh, as you said, I, I'm the chair of this uh, library committee. And uh, the image you see here is the library looking uh, towards the back of the building from the Fifth Avenue side. The windows at the back, which were industrial uh, windows, have been replaced uh, with, within the same panes with a leaded glass windows, which is more appropriate to the time and period of the club. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, this is a painting of the Salma Gundy Club in its very early days. It is painted by William Lowe and, and was published in 1880 in Scribner's Magazine. It is actually um, the club uh, when it was a sketch club uh, meeting in uh, Jonathan Scott Hartley, who is uh, standing with the white smock in the middle uh, next to the fisticuffs there. Uh, and William Lowe, who painted the painting, is on the left-hand side with the little sketchbook. But what's really interesting in this uh, Grisaille painting is that the uh, members of the club are critiquing their sketches, which is really what the name of the club was when it was founded in 1871 which was the Salma Gundy Sketch Club. Many people ask, where does the name of the club come from? And I, though it comes from various sources, um, I believe the real influence was from the Salma Gundy papers, which were written by, uh, by a number of editors, including Washington Irving. And these papers uh, poked fun at New York High Society, without naming them, they were very popular. And so this young club of young artists, when they came back from Paris and London, meeting the staid New York society, decided to name themselves sort of in revolt against, uh, against the uh, 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 academic uh, side of the National Academy. Uh, if you notice that um, Jonathan Scott Hartley in the center is uh, creating the Salma Gundy stew, which we still serve here uh, at the club in the dining room. And all, the artists would all gather and bring something in and just throw it into the pot for the stew. Next slide, please. Uh, just recently in honor of the 150th anniversary, the library and the Salma Gundy club we commissioned uh, a competition to create two paintings for the library doors, an allegory 
And this was done by the artist Noah Buchanan from Santa Cruz, California. The competition was nationwide and over 48 applicants had applied. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the treasures in the uh, Salmagundi Library, and the library was formed and created in 1891. The club only moved to this building in 1917. And when they did, they were able to expand and create many of these wonderful volumes. What we have here are the costume books from the club, over 20 volumes, where they created these books to help the artists that were illustrators so that they would have accurate costumes or uniforms when they were depicting or illustrating stories. The front page or the frontispiece of these books were done by various artists, mm -hmm. members of the club. And starting from the left-hand side, we have J.G. Brown with the, uh, with the boy and the dog. Uh, the next one is F.S. Church, uh, uh, and then there's uh, George Elmer Brown with the figure with the red background. The uh, ladies' costumes is an example of what is found in these costume books. And the last one is by F. Lewis Mora. The lettering on these pages were done by another club member by the name of Thomas Willings. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the Salmagundi um, uh, Medal of Honor and Merit by uh, Ulysses uh, A. Ritchie. Uh, the medal uh, award was started sh shortly after that time. And uh, this medal is awarded to, uh, to uh, uh, individuals who have made contributions to the art world or to the Salmagundi Club. And this medal has been given to very distinguished individuals. For example, Thomas Hoving, who was then the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Bill Gertz, uh, a very fine art historian who recently passed on. And then to such artists as Norman Rockwell, Ogden Pleisner, Al Hirschfeld, Frank Mason, as well as to the astronauts of Apollo 13, James Lovell, Fred Halsey and John Swigert. And the reason the astronauts were given this medal was because one of the members of the club, Lumen Winter, designed for NASA the logo that the astronauts wore on their uniforms. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the unusual uh, things, uh, this is the spirit of the wine by an unknown artist. Next slide, please. They created, they discovered that they needed to raise money to support a library. And so they came up with this novel idea of selecting as an honor 24 artists, uh, which would then auction off in Del uh, these mugs in Delft Blue to raise money for the library at the library dinner. And if we go from um, right uh, to left, the the first mug is by the uh, Japanese American artist and illustrator Jinjiro Yeto. Next to that is an early founding men, member, Edwin Austin Abbey, who um, um, uh, joined the club in 1884. Next to that is uh, um, um, uh, Chauncey Ryder and the musical one is by Edward Berg. And the uh, final one is James Carroll Beckwith of The Young Girl. The club has approximately a collection of about 150 bill yep. of these um, uh, mugs. And so if they auctioned them off, how did they all, uh, how were they all returned? The members would donate them back to the club. So uh, I hope that uh, the library is open to the public uh, during uh, uh, hours. And I hope that uh, the village pe uh, people will come and uh, make use of the library. It is a, uh, um, a, a quiet place for study and contemplation. 
That's my presentation. Thank you. Ariel. <laughs> So much. Next up, we have Jacob. So. Hello. Am I on? Yep. Yes. Okay. I don't have any slides. <clears throat> I just thought I would uh, talk a little bit about um, what Salma Gandhi. Uh, uh, I think what it what it means to me and to all of us at Salma Gandhi, and hopefully to um, to the broader world. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, thank you, Ariel, and thank you, Village uh, uh, Preservation, for uh, having us and for honoring us on our 150th. Um, I I was just mentioning a, a few a minute ago, a few minutes ago, uh, that I'm a lifetime New Yorker and I have a um, uh, just like so many of us, I have a, just a deep love of New York, but also a, sort of a, a tragic uh, relationship because it's changing always so much and so many things are, are disappearing, things that I remember are gone. And as you're all so uh, magnificently and stalwartly uh, uh, fighting, uh, things even right now that we love are, are, uh, are going away. So uh, I would just say keep up the fight, and I'm I'm uh, a, a, a big fan, and I, we all have to do this together. Um, I, uh, I it occurs to me that in a different way we're doing that at Selma Gandhi, which is that we are also a village preservation society, in that we're uh, preserving another thing about the village, which is a culture of artists, and our uh, community goes back. 150 years, and uh, we're uh, year by year, decade by decade, member by member, uh, preserving these relationships, these commu this community of artists. And one of the, it's so nice to think that uh, the older uh, members that, uh, that we have tie back, and then tie further back, and then we'll tie forward and hopefully further forward um, I'll just say quickly, we had a, a member who was a third generation member uh, named Guy Wiggins, who was the uh, uh, son and grandson of members, the famous New York artist family. Uh, he died at 100 years old last year. And uh, uh, he was a beloved figure. And I, I hadn't known him well until recently. I uh, spent about an hour talking with him in our magnificent bar, which any of you, who, if you haven't seen it, you have to come see it. It's a historic and amazing spot. We all love it. We spend way too much time in it. Um, and part of that time was me talking with uh, Guy Wiggins, the, the, the great uh, figure of our history. And uh, looking back, it does feel like in, it, it's the, the continuity of, of, the, of the relationships is something that's so valuable, particularly in uh, in, in our times when uh, there is a great deal of, of cultural rupture, always people move around, people in and out go to different places. And there's something about this place which has, which kind of re we revere its antiquity. It's sort of there's archaic qualities here, which I think is we share with um, uh, uh, we share with with you at Village Preservation. Um, so. Uh, so my thoughts about what what we are doing is uh, we're there's a we're in a kind of an interesting moment here at Salma Gandhi. Uh, Salma Gandhi has a a magnificent uh, you know its foundation and its origin is amazing. It fell a little bit on hard times. Uh, it, interestingly, it the the artists were dedicated to, probably not in a narrow way, but just maybe in a habitual way to a kind of a traditional representational art mode. And uh, they soldiered through the 20th century, uh, which wasn't in terms of, you know, our take on art history, the sexiest kind of art to be about throughout the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, but they were a great group and they kept on going. The membership got a little smaller, got, got actually at a certain point quite a bit smaller. And um, 
at a certain point, there was an inflection. And I would say I'll probably would turn to uh, Alex and Bill, who are real historians of the club. But maybe in, in the 80s or so, 90s, maybe things started to turn. And a couple of things happened. One is that there was a revived interest in myself and a lot of my friends and uh, Patricia as well were, were involved in it, a, a revived interest in, in uh, can we do um, a representational art in this mode again? And uh, there's many, many artists, myself and a lot of younger artists who've, who have been doing this. And Salma Gandhi, in, as is this wonderful, uh, solid ancient place has ancient by New York standards, has been uh, standing here waiting in some way for this new generation of artists to come and join and participate in this in the great tradition, join the older artists. And um, it feels it feels like a, a very optimistic moment uh, for uh, you know rebuilding and renewing uh, the 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 art tradition in this neighborhood, right in the middle of Greenwich Village, uh, that that Salma Gandhi has been uh, standing behind for so many decades. Um, so what I really am I'm hoping, what I'm looking for, is you know more artists, and there are so many. We have a so many artists joining more and more uh, patrons and collectors are joining and coming by the energy in the place is picking up uh, in a very dramatic way, which is very exciting for all of us, I think. And, um, uh, and it feels like the, our future is, is, is uh, it's a very, it's a very uh, seems without being over, uh, over optimistic, it seems like a, a sunny future that we really are doing something that will be a great boon to artists now and in the future and the, the public as well. So I um, hope I didn't go too short or too long, but that's what I had to say. Thanks so much, everybody. Very nice to, to talk with you all. Thanks so much. Yeah, and, and for, for folks who want to hear more, feel free to put questions in the q and I'm going to share my screen again for Nicholas. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, you've heard something of the history of the club and perhaps something of the future of the club so far. <clears throat> when I joined the club uh, over 10 years ago, I was told that the club had a great history, but that was about it. Uh, today, this is a club with a future. We were at 47 Fifth Avenue, by the way, between 11th and 12th Street on the east side. If you, if you look at us from the other side of the street, you'll notice that we're a house. Uh, I think, <clears throat> and I talked about this with Andrew Berman last week, I believe we're the oldest house on Fifth Avenue. 1854, this was completed, and it really hasn't changed much since then in many respects. Uh, come and see for yourself. We're open to the public every day, every day, seven days a week. So please come in if you're local <clears throat> and take a look at the Salma Gandhi Club. My, um, my job here, I think, really, is as chairman, is to encourage people to use the club in every respect and especially encourage local people to join the club. I think I speak for all of us here when I say that. Please come and see what that affords you. Um, <clears throat> Jacob just mentioned our bar, which is named the Wiggins Bar after a uh, three generations of Wiggins family prominent artists, the last of whom, as Jacob mentioned, we lost last year. Uh, Guy Wiggins, Guy C. Wiggins was perhaps the best known painting in the middle of the century. <clears throat> the painting on the left is very typical of a Guy Wiggins painting. Lots of snow scenes, lots of Manhattan street scenes, and characteristically an American flag sticking into the painting. Um, there's our bar, um, probably painted in Guy Wiggins time. I suspect this was painted, uh, sorry, this was taken, it's a photograph uh, in, a, in the, about 1930. Um, the bar doesn't change much. And one of our missions here is to keep Selma Gandhi like Selma Gandhi. And in some cases to make Selma Gandhi more like Selma Gandhi. We are doing that. Uh, Jacob, I think, put it very well just now in his explanation of where the club was some years ago and where it is today. Can we see the next slide, please? Um, 
We invented this cocktail. Come in and try one. We call it the Wiggins Manhattan. And yes, indeed, it's a standard Manhattan. Quite strong, by the way, to be on who's <clears throat> pouring it in the bar um, with a Wiggins signature on it. But we're very proud of our bar and indeed our dining room, which has recently been renovated, looking much today perhaps as it did when the luminaries sat and ate there. There's a window in there by Louis Comfort Tiffany, who was a member here 100 years ago, and ate in the bar. You, you, you can come in and be part of a continuum here, a continuum of American art history going back to 1871, and specifically in this building, going back to 1917, when the members held, held an auction selling their own artwork, raised enough money to buy 47 Fifth Avenue. And we've been here ever since and grateful to them ever since. And uh, we'll see the next slide, please. Here's one of our uh, rooms, which we named after the founding uh, family, Joseph Hartley and his brother. That's Joseph Hartley in portrait there. Uh, we call this the Hartley Room. It was formerly a dressing and bedroom in the house. And much of our, our building here is pretty much a house that hasn't been changed. There are old bedrooms upstairs. There are period rooms like this. We use this today and it's adjacent to the library as a reception room, as a member or as a non-member for that matter. You can rent this room. You can have your own little private affair in here, a dinner, a cocktail party or whatever. It's, it's a beautiful room. Can you see the next one, please? Now, this is the parlor immediately below where we're sitting right now in the library, the same footprint. Um, we believe it's really the only double parlor left intact on Fifth Avenue yeah, architecturally. And you come in, you'll, you'll be impressed by it. There are two magnificent marble fireplaces. This column arrangement is in the center of the room. Uh, you're looking through onto Fifth Avenue through the west windows. Um, we use this to display art, of course, and all of the art we display here is by our members, past and present. The exception being when we have a temporary exhibition, which may be in our main gallery or one of the smaller galleries, which may be the work of, of non-members, but almost everything we show and certainly everything we show permanently is members' work. Um, <clears throat> We're unique in that respect. And, and some people have said, well, you're like any other arts club. But no, we're not. We're not an arts club. We're an artists club. We were founded by and for professional artists. And, and a great many professional artists still come to us, join us and are members here. Um, what's the next slide, please? Is there another slide? Or I think we're done. We're done with slides. So I'd, like to, do, I'd like to finish up just by saying you're all welcome at Selma Gundy. There are lots of fabulous events here. Right now, downstairs, there are 30 people making monotype prints on historic monotype print presses. One of which, by the way, was made around the corner on 10th Street. James McNeil Whistler made prints here. We are um, always inviting people in to learn about art, to experience art in many, many ways. We have lectures um, and <clears throat> we are just, Delighted to meet you. So please come and see us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Patricia, I've got you up next. Hi, Ariel. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. I am going to tell you a little bit tonight about the art and exhibits that are at the Sama Gandhi Club and tell you a little bit about some of the contemporary uh, exhibits and projects that we do with living artists. Um, you know, what is Samagandhi? We've talked about Samagandhi, like many other clubs in New York City, a little bit is a social club, but really for artists, it's a professional association, a professional club. Us artists spend a lot of time alone in our rooms and we don't necessarily have a water cooler or a place where you just spend time with your coworkers to learn about what are the professional practices or website or marketing or you know ideas that when you work with other people in an office that you naturally share. And so Salma Gundy is a place that provides that for living artists. Um, and, and is a wonderful resource for living artists. Um, us, 
New Yorkers also, I think, appreciate the idea of a, of a club, of a place to go as a third space. Um, I live in a relatively small space in New York. I imagine many of you do. And my living room long ago became my art studio. So it's also the Salman Gandhi Club serves that place that has probably always been for New York City, which is that people need a place to gather and a place where there's space to sit down and have a drink with six friends or have dinner with six friends that we don't necessarily have in our in our homes. So that's one of the things that New York is for me. I'm an artist member. Um, so I'm a, a working artist. We also have been patron members who are just patron who are uh, other members who are just enthusiasts for art, of uh, all kinds of art. We're not just painters, artist members could be writers, musicians, even architects. Um, and then we also have junior members and scholarship members. So we support young artists who are more emerging in their careers to give them a place to connect with this community, um, either on a scholarship or a, as a junior member. Um, the thing we also do, the mission of the club is to have to present the work of artists. Um, and it's important that it's part of our bylaws for 150 years that we present the work of artists, we support originality in the arts, we support the work and the professional life livelihood of artists. And it's a privilege that the club has this space where we can show the work of art and artists based basically on our philosophy or what we think is important or what is our mission, as opposed to other galleries that might have more commercial um, you know, motives or might have um, maybe an institution that is having to be um, beholden to a donor, right? We as an artist club, we, are, we have a, a philosophy and mission that is driven by artists and we're able to then present to the public the, the work of artists that we want to support. Um, we have a lot of shows over the course of um, the year annually. Salma Gundy Club actually produces, produces over 12 shows of artwork either by Salma Gundy members or open calls, which are then invited to, to artists both nationally and internationally to participate. Um, so one of the famous shows that we've been doing for the longest time at our club is called the Black and White Show. This sh slide that I'm sharing is actually Winslow Homer, who participated in a Black and White Show. I'm not sure what year, but those shows would have gone back to 1878. And between 1878, 1890s, they produced a number of very important uh, and well-publicized Black and White Shows that attracted artists like Winslow Homer, John Sargent, Whistler, and Thomas Eakins. And significantly, they also showed the work of women artists at that time in the late 19th century when women artists were often shut out from exhibition opportunities. Uh, the next slide, Ariel. So the black and white show shows work of drawings and of prints. And like they said, there's the printmaking uh, Act, uh, project going on right now at the club. Printmaking is a, still a very active concern at the club. So supporting black and white and graphic arts and also paintings uh, and other types of work, but specifically in black and white. Um, so that's been the oldest uh, traditional show that we've been doing for almost as long as the club has been around. Um, the next slide, please. This is a slide from a recent uh, event that was a what we call a drink and draw. So just like the slide that Alex showed at the top, the club was formed as a sketch group in John uh, Jonathan Hartley's studio. And basically we just continue to do the exact same thing. We hire a live model, we get together as artists, we have some drinks and we work from a life model for uh, three hours together at, um, at the club. Those events are actually open to the public and ticketed. So if you're interested in doing something like that, you could join us and, and find tickets at the, on the club's website. Um, we, New York City is a place that is full of figurative artists and full of artists who are trained in representational and realist painting. So the kind of artwork that is based on visual, on traditional and more academic training, um, 
there are many places in the world where that kind of pedagogy, that kind of training was lost. But here in New York City, we have had a tremendous lineage of teachers who have taught at places like the Art Students League, the School of Visual Arts, the Studio School, um, places like Salma Gandhi that have kept this tradition as a living tradition throughout this whole time. Um, and one of the things that's great about Salma Gandhi as an artist is it gives us an opportunity to connect with artists who maybe also make representational work, but coming from a little bit different school or a different tradition. So New York City is rich with realist and figurative artists and Salma Gandhi is a place where we can connect. Uh, the next slide. This is an example of the kind of more figurative art that you would see at the drink and draw. And the next one uh, is a, another, a different artist. So those are both from the same drink and draw event, giving you, you know, a little bit of a picture of the range of graphic styles that you might see. Um, I myself am a student of, um, of Jacobs and of Ted Seth Jacobs, who taught at the Art Students League and studied with Frank Vincent Dumond and originally goes back all the way to the Academy Julian. And, in Paris, and this is a drawing by my friend Brooks Frederick, who was a student of Leonard Anderson and uh, the and well-known New York artist. And so Salman Gandhi is a place where we preserve and sh connect and share the traditions and history of all of the important teachers and lineages that are connecting to, to living artists doing this practice today. Uh, the next slide. Uh, on view at the club right now, uh, down in the lower gallery in the basement, there is a show called Allegory Today. Um, this show was inspired, you saw the doors for the library. That was an uh, award uh, to an artist named Noah Buchanan, one of our members. But down in the lower gallery, you can see a collection of all of the different allegorical works that were created for this competition for the library. And you can see, um, it's fascinating to see how all of these contemporary artists are thinking about these figurative allegorical compositions. So that's on view in the lower gallery at the club right now. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a thumb box. One of the other shows that is a historic tradition at our club is called the Thumb Box Exhibit, which is on view in the Skylight Gallery in our largest gallery on the main floor. It's up right now, the 113th Annual Thumb Box Exhibition and Sale. A thumb box is a word for a small uh, easel and palette combined that an artist can hold and then make a very small sketch. So this is a little advertising of, a, of an old thumb box. So the thumb box paintings are all small in scale and inspired by the idea that an artist would have this kind of palette and do them in situ. The next slide. This is a living tradition. This is a contemporary Peshad box where the small panel is only about four foot by, I mean, sorry, four inches by six inches on a very small easel. And you can put that little easel in your backpack with your paints and go to, you know, go on a day trip to the beach and make paintings. A lot of artists at the Salma Gandhi Club do this kind of plein air sketching where you're working out outdoors or maybe sketching in a park in New York City. So that's a very lively tradition here in, here at the Salma Gandhi Club. Uh, the next slide. There, I'm showing two paintings that are in our Thumbbox exhibit right now. One is by our member Jennifer Hansen Rowley called Yellow Cake. I just find it delicious and delightful. So this is on view in our parlor gallery right now. And the next slide, uh, a painting of actually a view of the library window, which I find very um, beautiful and like draws me in. It's called The Light in the Library by another Salma Gundy artist, uh, Tony D'Amico. Um, the next slide. So I'm just gonna sh tell you a little bit some about our some of our other exhibits that are our regular exhibits that we have coming up. Um, Every year we have a photography show. Um, we have one scheduled every summer. 
And so we have uh, photography as part of our artist members um, and support that and the range of, of styles of work and, and styles of art in the club. Um, so there's a photography show that's coming in the summer. Also uh, in the summer will be the Coast Guard art program show. Uh, one of our initiatives at Salmagundi Club is to support the Coast Guard art program through having artists create work that shows the work of, this, of the Coast Guard. Um, and often um, then that work can go into the collection, the permanent collection of the Coast Guard. So that's an initiative that Salmagundi has. Uh, we have other exhibits um, regularly, like two annual auctions in the spring and the fall our annual members show, uh, which includes a purchase prize award and our curator, Bill Lindersky, I think will be showing you some of the images that we have in our permanent collection that many of which were a purchase prize award from that annual members show, which we have coming up in the spring. We also have a tradition of a president's invitational. So that's coming up in February. Um, we're now calling it the Hartley Invitational. And so our president, Jacob Collins, will be working to curate and develop an invitational show of some of the best artists of Salma Gandhi and also other arts um, that we want to present to the public. Um, the next slide, I think is the last one I have. Um, we have one show coming up in June that, I mean, sorry, in January that opens January 8th and goes through uh, the 30th, and it's called the New York Figurative Show, um, highlighting work by Salmagundi artists and non-members around the country who make figurative work. Our club, um, as a place that shows realist and representational artists, is going to be one of the places where you're gonna see a great deal of figurative art and you always have. So this is an important annual exhibit that we do every year and I hope you'll come by and see it. This is a painting by David Baird called Red Nude and uh, we'll have it at the gallery in January. Um, thank you, I think that's the end of uh, what I have to say. Patricia, thank you so much. Bill, I've got you next. Hey, everybody. Hey. Um, so my name is Bill Andersky. I am the curator, the chair of the curate, um, curatorial committee for the Selma Gundi. Um, the 1,100 members that we have um, vote on all the different positions of the club. And about 200 people in total actually work together to volunteer to actually power the club, which is pretty amazing. So I'm very honored to be able to uh, head the curatorial committee. Um, we have 1900 works, give or take. And um, what's really interesting about us is we get to be able to present um, like the Frick, works in sort of a natural, more relaxed environment, a home environment versus let's say just a pure white box studio. Um, and so this slide shows you um, a recent show that is currently up um, called Funny Looks. And it is basically three different collections of artists drawing each other in character drawings um, the lower level um, you'll see there is from 1937. The middle level is from 1916. And then the top level is 1987. So it's a real mix and range of people. Um, what's also fascinating is one of my favorite drawings um, below the sconce in the middle there. Um, it, it's a character drawing from 1937 from uh, William Orbach Levy, and I call it the smoking walnut. I, I love it. I just think it's just the funniest, weirdest little thing. And we present it in the bar because in some ways, a lot of these drawings were done while drinking at the bar. Um, so 1916, the middle row with the gray backgrounds, um, that was done by uh, Leo Meisner and his works, He's one of the top portraitists of his time. 
Um, his father was a famous rabbinical scholar um, who worked as the head of the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, um, but originally born here in New York. He painted four US presidents. And so we are very fortunate to have 90 drawings by the artist. Um, 1987, the top drawings, are uh, probably more for familiar, like you've seen them, this sort of style at uh, like Great Adventure or some of the sort of amusement parks. But this particular artist is still a member from uh, with our, uh, with the um, Salma Gundi. And um, she basically professionally does um, this type of art. So I wanted to show you just in general, the kinds and range of uh, art that we present um, and all the types of spaces that they're in. Next slide. So we have sculpture. Um, we have usually about, um, the collection is 1900 pieces. And so about 40 pieces are sculpture. The sculpture kind of sprinkles throughout the entire townhouse. Um, and this is just one of the many that is likely a one of a kind um, and incredibly rare of John, this one particularly of Jonathan Scott Harley. Next, please. So this one I, I love, they call it the owl. Um, I used to hang her behind me um, in my office where I worked so that she would kind of scold me to keep working harder. Um, but this was part of a recent exhibition called 1880 something. Um, the, the exhibitions change every two to three months. And we have about five locations that they happen in throughout the townhouse that is completely open to the public. Next, please. So we, how does all these works get into our collection? How did the 1900 happen? Well, most of them are purchase prizes where we, um, as a club, have bought some of the best works from each of our exhibitions. Um, then we often have former members who, in honor of other people, will donate works um, of previous um, artists from our organization. So this one is one of the more current purchase prizes, uh, Demers, and it's, it's just incredible, really beautiful, quite big. Next, please. Another one, um, this one, again, a realist painting. Again, we show realism and um, representational art. And so this one is one of the more contemporary ones by a living artist um, that was a purchase prize. Next, please. But because we have been getting the purchase prizes over all these many years, we have an incredible range of American artists. Really, the history of American art is written in our archives. And so this one from John, John Fabian Carlson, part of the Woodstock um, group, um, always used to paint snow scenes. This particular painting actually was just clean. It's very small. It's maybe eight by 10. Um, this one was just clean for um, an exhibition showing all of our small thumb box paintings for the first time ever all together um, to the public at one time. It's the first time in the 150 years of its history that they were all shown at one time. And we've been really fortunate uh, through generous donations um, to be able to clean and restore 13 of these small, um, really gem paintings. Next, please. Oh, so here's another one. So the range of art, um, there's a whole variety of realism. So we have impressionists from the 20s and 30s. This one is a fallen speed, um, again, eight by 10-ish. Um, and this one was just cleaned as well. This is the, after the cleaning. Um, and just the quality of the work is incredible. Um, it's really 
nice to see these little gems uh, of the collection. And like I said, now they're on display. Next, please. But the collection began with um, the earliest artists. And most of our earliest artists were illustrators. Um, but like all kids, because the art, because the, the club was started with like 21 and 22 year olds. And they were, of course, as a 22 year old, 21 year old, you rebel against your parents. And so their parents were the um, Hudson River School painters. And so in rebel against that, after they were trained in Munich and Paris, they went and did tonalism. And so we have an incredible collection of tonalist paintings. Um, this particular one, uh, just you can see the ex absolute expression of tonalism because it's not about color. It's just about harmony and gray, black, and white. Jake Francis Murphy. Yeah, this is John Francis Murphy. Sorry, I didn't mention. Um, next, please. So one of the things I'm trying to do as the curator um, is to share with um, people things that have not been on public display either ever or for many years. Um, and so one of the recent shows was on Cornwell, an illustrator, an American illustrator, um, famous for his murals. And this, these are some of the drawings that were donated to us in 1986 that um, have never been on public display. And just recently for about two and a half months, they were on public display for the first time ever. Um, and this particular one I, I love, I think the subtlety and beauty uh, is incredible. And you can always tell um, in these sorts of drawings that it was meant for a mural because of how strong all of the outlines are and how definitive they are. Uh, which is obviously something you would have to do if you were doing, let's say, like a, a fresco or a mural. Next, please. That's it. Oh, okay. Well, that's it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm going to stop my share and open up our very active q and a and big shout out to Perry for all of the great links in the chat make sure to check those out everybody and we'll send out an email uh, at following the the event that will include all of these links into if, if you want to check them out later. Um, so we have some we have many questions okay. So Joan asks, where was the club located before its present location? Uh, in 1871, when the club was founded, they did not have a permanent location. They met in different artist studios. One of the studios that they met in was the Skylight Studio of Jonathan Scott Hartley, which you saw in that painting. That studio is now owned by NYU. Another studio that they met on 14th Street was Napoleon Cerrone's photographic studio where they would have meetings. So basically the club was roaming from studio to studio from 1871 to the 1890s. In 1891, they rented um, uh, 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 John, uh, John Rogers studio that was at 12 West 14th Street and became the first permanent location for the club. It is at that location that the library began and the collections of the club began as well as the palette collection of the club which is also unique in this country. Thank you. Great. Um, we also have um, a question from about from Olga about about 47 Fifth Avenue. 
Um, who was the original owner of the building? Uh, the, uh, the building was built 18, uh, uh, 53, 54, uh, we, when they, um, when we did a renovation of the main gallery, we found a chalk mark on one of the original beams, which said 1853. So I think we're now more leaning to the 1853 date. Um, the building was built by uh, the Hawley family of which we have portraits uh, hanging in the parlor. And uh, uh, the club did not acquire the building until 1917. And uh, as Nick or, or Jacob said, the, uh, the artists raised the money to buy the building uh, by selling artwork in two auctions, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And they raised 75,000 which was a lot of money in 1917 to pay for this brownstone. So artists have supported and paid for this existing historic building. And this building is landmarked on Lower Fifth Avenue because it is one of the last remaining brownstones on Fifth Avenue with the premier etage or where the entrance is you come up to the second floor, which is really the first floor of the building. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, we have a lot of questions about membership. How does someone become a member? What are the tiers of membership? How many members are there? Um, is there, a, is there a membership structure for seniors? Uh, I can answer all that. We have about 1,050 members, which is more, uh, in fact, than I think we've ever had, or as many. In fact, tonight we have what's called an admissions meeting with new members coming in, and there are 25 new members coming in tonight and tomorrow night this month. We do it once a month. Uh, that's something of a record, but we've been taking in quite a lot of new members uh, in recent times. It's actually very easy to become a member as what we call a patron member, whereby you can apply if we like you, uh, we'll make you a patron member. We love local, what we call resident members. We live within 50 miles of 47th Avenue. Um, patron members, by the way, who are resident pay about $850 a year for membership privileges, which includes privileges to several dozen other clubs internationally, uh, an extraordinary list of clubs, including two, uh, uh, two or three, right, three or four actually right here in New York City. You can use the National Arts Club, for instance, and the Players Club if you're a member here. Um, beyond that, there are different levels of membership. To be an artist member, it's a bit like, I guess, getting into a good art school. You have to supply a portfolio. It's looked at by the art committee they decide whether they say, yes, you, you're good, you're good enough to be, a, you're the right, it's not good enough, you're the right person to be a Salma Gandhi artist. Um, or they might say, no, we don't think you're ready yet. Or they might say, come back in six months or something. But that's a little bit more difficult. We do reject a fair number of people who apply as uh, artists. Then there are other levels of membership. You can be a junior member, junior scholarship members, Start at 21 years old, there's no one younger than that, uh, but going up to 35, and we have about 75 junior members. To be a junior member in the first year, you pay nothing. Uh, you pay no application fee, which by the way is $200 for everyone else, um, and you pay no fees at all for the first year and no dues, um, and very little dues going forward as a junior scholarship member. If you live, as most of our members do, by the way, beyond 50 miles from this building, you pay about $450 a year, or as I say, $1.50 a day to, for all the privileges. It's an extraordinarily good deal. Uh, there are no uh, special deals for seniors, I'm afraid to say. Although if you've been a member for more than 50 years, we waive your dues. <laughs> um, that's typical in all New York City clubs. Uh, but no, we don't, have, we don't have special deals for seniors, um, but we have a lot to offer seniors. 
Um, beyond that, there are a few other anomalies in, in membership. We have honorary members uh, and so on, but um, I think that explains it all. Thank you, thanks. Um, we have a question from Jay. Was the club ever men only? Good question. Um, Bill, why don't you take that oh, one? Okay. <laughs> okay. So the club um, was a, um, members of men only from nine, um, all the way up until 1973. Um, and then um, we started to allow women. But women were allowed in the club. Um, it's just, it was very specified days and times and events. Um, before that, though, the earliest um, club exhibitions were open to women. Now, it's not proven, we're not sure, but we believe that because a lot of the earliest members owed a lot to a particular woman, one of the earliest Cooper Union women um, to be an artist, um, she loaned her, her space because she was a widower, she loaned her space to the club. And so I think since she was starting her own female or women only club that they didn't want to like, like overlap with her so that they perhaps actually chose to be men only because of that. It, it's, un, it's really hard to prove though, unfortunately. Interesting. Thanks, that is- Can I just really add fun. something to that? Um, well, we, we did convert in, in 1973. Most New York City clubs that were men only did not convert for about 10 years after that, when they were made to convert uh, under various legal statutes. And some, of course, have never converted. There are still all men's clubs and still all women's clubs. Um, so we were somewhat early in, in the process. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Um, so Jay also wants to know, does anyone live in the building or has anyone lived in the building? Uh, the uh, uh, many years ago, they used to have rooms on the fourth floor that where artists uh, that uh, came from different parts of the country would uh, be able to rent a studio space in the building. And I recently uh, found out, and I had not known this, that Norman Rockwell, when he came to New York, actually uh, rented uh, studio space in the building here. And it is one of the reasons he had such fond memories of the club. So I think it's wonderful testament uh, of it. We no longer rent rooms because uh, the collection is now on the fourth floor of the building. And uh, uh, our affiliation with the National Arts Club allows people to rent uh, space with the National Arts Club. Thank you. Hey. Can I add to that? The only, the only uh, things living here right now are the ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. is, the, is the house haunted? Uh, well, we have stories. <laughs> well, what, do, what do you think, Ariel? It's the oldest house on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> Most of them probably are. Amazing. Um, well, we've had seances in the building. Uh, in the history of the club, they talk in the late 19th century of having one or two seances. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, of course, that was very popular uh, at that time. Debbie, Debbie is in the chat speaking what I feel, which is that we would love to attend a seance at the club. That would be great. <laughs> well, to, to also even add to that, there's um, we are the first private residents um, in Manhattan to get kegs delivered. Um, beer kegs. Beer kegs. <laughs> so um, according to the history uh, on Fifth Avenue. Okay, so um, we have a couple of challenge related questions. One is sort of more generally, what are the biggest challenges of running the club? And the other from Michael, um, hi Michael, 
is how has the pandemic um, impacted the club? Uh, I'm happy to, to address that. In, in an ironic way that the pandemic helped us. Uh, we were, of course, pretty dark for almost 18 months. This allowed us to do a significant amount of construction work within the building without interfering with our, our membership uh, uh, activities. We did, um, we had our dining and bar facilities closed for well over a year. And actually this, this helped us because it saved us money. Uh, this is an obligation we have that costs us money typically. So we were able to save a little money. Also by furloughing some of our staff, we were able to save a little money. And with a 501c3 status, we were able to recoup some grant money from being closed in, um, in COVID. So COVID, I, I'm happy to say, did not affect us negatively. I'm also very proud to say that um, our members did not desert us during COVID. Even though many of them live a, well, a long distance away and were not able to come here, they stayed loyal, they paid their dues. We lost very, very few members because of COVID for any reason. And since, uh, you know, I guess we're still in COVID, in the last six months, let's say, we've been gaining membership dramatically. I, I believe, and many of us do here, that post COVID, the private club will become a much more important part of a lot of persons, a lot of people's cultural life. It's a place you can come, you can feel somewhat protected here. You kind of got in here with that with vaccination. Um, it's quiet here. It's never crowded here. You can eat in the dining room, drink in the bar, and it's relaxed. Not only that, but you can come in here as an individual or a couple or whatever, walk in anytime we're open. You'll get invited. Come and have dinner with us. Come and have a drink with us. It doesn't happen in a restaurant. And in, and in post-COVID times, this is very, um, it's very attractive to a lot of people who have been missing company. Um, I'm not sure what the other part of the question was. How, what are the challenges? Of running, say, of running the club. I mean, in many ways, Jacob and I are the leadership of the club at the moment. I'm chairman of the board. Jacob's the president. Traditionally, the president has been the head of show here in many ways. Um, my challenge is very simple. My, my job is to keep the doors open and keep the club fiscally and physically healthy. My challenge is... Um, really doing that. There's so many different levels of challenge that uh, I come across all the time. Like everyone else on this table, I'm, I'm a volunteer. We're all volunteers here. So finding the time to do all that is another challenge. But just keeping everybody happy, keeping our 1,050 members happy, and um, you know, keeping the club fiscally, physically healthy. That's a challenge. Jacob? I'd say uh, that... Um... Artists are passionate uh, people, and um, a whole lot of artists is going to be challenging, um, which, but that's great. So one of the things that we have is a lot of different kinds of artists, and, and uh, we have artists who are successful professionals, and we have artists who are serious amateurs, and we have artists who are uh, talented uh, uh, in, in many different ways, and we have uh, lots of different exhibitions and not everyone gets to be in every one. So people, you know, people have to, you know, get a little frustrated and have to get along. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, trying to navigate that is always going to be hard because I, you know, we all want, I want everybody to feel invested and happy. And I think we all want that. Um, and uh, just as, but it just, just to be an artist is a very vulnerable thing. So you put your work out, your, your peers are judging it. So that, that's, a, you know, that's exciting. I mean, that's, we all have to uh, try to support each other. I guess that's what we, that's what we do. That's what we're here for. I have one other comment about challenges, which is that we're talking today about it being the 150th anniversary and our collection shows many significant important American artists of the past. But I think that one of our challenges is to communicate to New Yorkers today that this is a place that we want you to come now to see the art that's being made now. 
And so to get people to just know that the Samagandhi Club is open to the public, we are a free museum. You can just walk in. You don't have to be a member. The doors are open seven days a week to get people to know that it's a place where there are new exhibits going up almost every two weeks um, and that it's a living and thriving place uh, for contemporary art. I think that's one of our challenges is to for people to not just think about what Samagandhi has been, but what, what it is now and what we hope it will be. Yeah, well said. Thanks. So I'm going to, um, ask just one more question, which comes to us from Jean. Hello, Jean. Um, who wants to know, can you tell us about some of the upcoming exhibitions and what's what's up at the club? Okay. okay. <laughs> hey, so um, for the historic exhibitions um, of the collection, we have some pretty exciting things coming up. We have Lalik and Muka coming up next year, uh, which is pretty exciting. We will be showing the largest collection of Lalik drawings outside of the Lalik Museum um, for the first time to the public. So that is a big deal. Um, we've got Emil Carlson um, exhibition, which should be incredible. It'll be the largest Emil Carlson exhibition, I think, um, in almost 50 years in New York. Um, there will be, uh, right currently, right now, we have an incredible uh, puppet show um, exhibition that is just like a fantasy of, of Christmas and holidays combined. Um, we have been fortunate enough to have three of America's most important puppeteers as past members. And so we're showing their work right now um, and we have a lecture coming up on the 21st about that. Um, and that's just some of the things. Of course, you can check out the website. There are like a complete list, um, but there's also living artists. We have, um, uh, we mm -hmm. have right now still up this beautiful thumb box show, which uh, Patty showed us the little uh, picture of the thumb box. Mm -hmm. We have coming up uh, a couple of the shows coming up. We have the, a black and white show, which is this goes back 140 years, it seems. It's a great show. Uh, works in in, uh, in black and white and gray. Um, and we have uh, the Hartley Invitational coming up, which is a big deal, inviting, uh, trying to put together a kind of a state of the art of the contemporary sort of figurative uh, artists. Um, and that's sort of slated to become a, a maybe a biannual or a annual show. So. But there's always shows. There's always interesting and wonderful shows. They just keep on, keep on turning over. Lots happening. So what, what are the dates of the Lalique ex exhibit? Um, you should be able to see them on the website. I don't remember the exact dates offhand. Um, I think it's April next year. I, I can't remember offhand now. Um, it's been sliding around, but I think you should be able to see it on there. They'll also Lafarge, Tiffany and Lamb is next year. Uh, there's so many great, incredible ones. So exciting. The New York Figurative Show, which is the living artists um, and the current you know, membership. That one is, is January 8 to 30. And there's actually gonna be a panel discussion with some young emerging figurative artists on January 14th. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, and we'll, um, we'll include links to all of the exhibitions and to the events calendar and, and everything else in our follow up email. So definitely, definitely check, check out all of those things, get involved. Um, I think I can, I think I can speak for everyone who's here just to say how, um, how wonderful this has been to to learn about the, the history and the building and the, the art of the club. It's just such a such a wonderful, warm, beautiful, beautiful place to step into. Um, I'm so, so grateful for all of you. Is there anything else we should know that we haven't covered yet? Just drop in. <laughs> drop in come join us. 
Great. Vita Salmagande. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So thank thank you so much to um to all of you at the Salma Gandhi Club. Um, we're so delighted to celebrate the 150th anniversary with you. Um, thank you everyone for being here with us and have such a wonderful evening. Well, we're looking forward to keeping in touch. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye.